Hi everyone, welcome back. So now we're in chapter 10 of engineering materials. We're gonna be dealing with phase transformations. So the big thing here is if I cool something or if I heat it, I might change its phase. Now, when I'm talking about phase, I'm not necessarily meaning that it's going to go from a liquid to a solid, though that definitely will happen. But I want to talk about more about repeating structures here. So like right there, this is what's called austenite. I have iron and I have crystal, or carbon, crystal, because carbon atoms that is just interspersed throughout this. Okay, the carbon atoms are equally spaced, and so this is a particular structure. And this is a face-centered cubic structure. Now, if I were to cool it, what will happen? Well, when I cool it, I'll have a eutectoid transformation. I go from one solid phase to two solid phases. And in this case, I'm no longer face-centered cubic, I am body-centered cubic. So I've already changed my crystal structure. Also, um, carbon went from being a part of that crystal structure. As you can see before with austenite, it was um, equally spaced to just being an impurity. However, I have this secondary right here, which is cementite, which has a separate and different crystal structure. So we're gonna be talking about all of these, like how does cooling or heating up change our phase? How does it change our structure? How does it change how carbon and iron interact? So that's a lot to take in. So first off, let's simply talk about the basics here, which is nucleation. So for any sort of transition I have here, I'm going to have nuclei, they're gonna act as my seeds by which my crystals change and grow into something else. This doesn't matter actually if I'm, you know, heating or cooling. So I could be going, you know, uh, I could be heating it up and going from, you know, two solids to a liquid or reverse, reverse it, going from a liquid to two solids or from two solids to a different solid or from a solid and liquid to a new solid. There's all these options here. And I can go either direction. For us, we're gonna be focusing on eutectoid a lot this time because while we really do care about what happens when we go from liquid to a solid, um, we also care about how we transition between phases in a solid. So going from two solids to a different solid phase. So in all of these cases, it doesn't matter if I'm solid or liquid, I might have pure liquid to begin with, and then I'm gonna have these little nuclei. They're going to begin to form. And when they form, they are going to, going to disappear or they're gonna to begin to get bigger. As they get bigger, they'll eventually reach the point where the whole thing is completely covered in these crystal structures. And I have these crystals and now it is a solid. Okay. As you might guess, if you have a small supercooling, well, guess what? You're gonna have a slow nucleation rate. Since you have a slow nucleation rate, you're going to have few nuclei and you'll have very large crystals. If you have very fast supercooling, you'll have a rapid nucleation rate, many nuclei, and therefore very small crystals. And this is important. Why? Well, we'll find out later. But just know that how many crystals you have and how large they are is very important to the overall strength and ductility of your metal. Okay, a couple more terms here and then we'll be done. So homogeneous nucleation. So it is possible for nuclei to form in the bulk of a liquid metal, which means that it's happening like everywhere at once. However, we have to have a lot of supercooling for this to happen. We'll see much more often, at least in normal cases, like in your water bottle, will be heterogeneous nucleation. So in this case, I have something that is stable, like a nucleating surface, um, an impurity in the water itself, that's going to allow it to freeze more easily. Think snowflakes in this case. You have dirt in the air and that dirt turns into a snowflake. And so this only requires slight supercooling for it to happen. So you want it to happen throughout the bulk of the material, you gotta be really, really, really like a big change. If you want it to happen from edges or from impurities, it only takes a little bit less. Now, why do these nuclei grow or shrink? And when will they continue to grow and when will they continue to shrink? Well, there's actually an equation for this. So it's all about energy. So as I get bigger and bigger, you can see here's my nuclei, and I'll say it starts here and it gets moves outward, it's getting bigger. Well, as it gets bigger, well, its surface area also gets bigger. 
And just like with a bubble you've blown as a kid, the bigger the bubble that is, the harder it is for that bubble to stay stable. It wants to pop. Why? Because there's a lot of energy being stored in that surface tension. The more surface you have, the more surface tension energy you have. And so that's right here. It's going up. Second thing we have is our volume bulk free energy. So nature always wants to find the easiest shape possible. And so the easiest shape possible is when everything is as close together as possible, which is a sphere, which is probably the four-thirds pi r cubed right here. And so with that, this is my negative energy. This is the stabilizing energy. So I have destabilizing surface energy, and I have stabilizing volume bulk energy. And so when I add those together, I get my total free energy. And so if I want my crystals to grow, I have to get over the hump here. So you can see that at this point right here, my total free energy is a maximum, and I always want it to decrease. Like nature wants to have as low an energy as possible. And so you can see that below this critical radius right here, um, I'm going, if I'm going to decrease my energy, I have to get smaller, which means they disappear. And above that critical radius, if I want to decrease my energy, I have to actually um, continue to grow. So below this radius, I will grow. Sorry, below this radius, I will shrink to nothing. And above my critical radius, I will begin to continue to grow until there's no more material to add. And there's a nice little equation for this. So first off, we have our surface free energy, our melting temperature, the latent heat of solidification, and finally our supercooling. For most problems, this is the one that's going to be given. That's something that changes. Everything else is material specific. So melting temperature, surface free energy, latent heat solidification, those are usually given to you or they're in a table and you look them up. Supercooling is what you usually plug in here. So this is really a plug and chug equation. As a note, these guys are weakly dependent on temperature. So most problems you won't have to deal with that, but if you're being hyper accurate, you wouldn't want to take that into account. And the greater my sub sorry, supercooling, the smaller that critical radius. It's easier for these nuclei to grow. It's just easier for them to grow. And of course, the lower your subcooling, the harder it is for them to grow. If you're talking about typical solidification for typical, you know, iron alloys, these nuclei are about 10 nanometers wide before they begin to grow. So don't think like gigantic nuclei. They're, they're very, very small when they begin to be stable and grow. So that's it for this time. Thank you so much. I'll see you all in a little bit. Bye-bye.